So, time for the entertainment you all came here to see. Uh, this is Manifolds, Dions, and Brains, oh my, uh, the presentation I put together on my uh, string theory research this summer. So, here's the layout as you can see. And uh, to start us off, there are some mathematical tools I'd like to explain that uh, I needed to learn at the beginning of this summer in order to be able to analyze my work properly. I'll start off with four vectors. Now, uh, some of you may have seen vectors in introductory physics courses or something like that, or even if you haven't, there's, this is a vector right here. Um, it's basically, it's just something that describes displacement or momentum or something like that that has four different components to it. And as you can see, there's, it works, there's an x, a y, and a z here. So those are just, you know, normal Cartesian positions. And then this four vector also includes time up here. Um, and then I've got similar down here. I have, this is for a spherical coordinate system. So there's r theta phi, um, and then also another time. And then off along the side here, I've put, you can see the r theta phi again for spherical, but I also have this extra coordinate k here that represents an extra dimension. And uh, I'd like you to keep that in mind because it's gonna be important throughout the rest of the talk. And uh, so, one tool in which we can use to sort of manipulate these four vectors is the metric. Um, now the metric, which is normally denoted by G, as I've put over here, um, is just something that will describe the shape of space around an object. Um, and as you can see, the Cartesian metric that I put here, it's pretty simple. It's just describing flat space with normal x, y, and z, so nothing too complicated there. Um, but mass and energy can also curve space, which is why I put that picture at the bottom there. Um, if you want to, you can think of it inside that sort of depression, there's the sun, and then that little ball is the Earth orbiting it along the curves of space, which is where um, sort of Einstein's general relativity and theory of gravity comes from. And, uh, but yeah, so the Cartesian metric is pretty simple, like I said. the. Spherical is also describing flat space, but it looks a little more complicated just because it's based on a spherical coordinate system, so all the points are points on a curved sphere. All right, so we've talked about how space can curve, so now let's talk about some extra dimensions and uh, how those relate to this concept of duality. Um, so first of all, string theory requires that we have additional spatial dimensions. That is, that's, that's what theory requires to work. So you may say, um, well, I've been walking down the hall. I've never experienced a new sp a way to go because a spatial dimension would indicate a new way to sort of walk suddenly. Um, well, your explanation for that is they're all curled up. These extra dimensions are all curled up. So you can't, they're, they're too small for us to sort of experience. So you can think of that sort of like in this tightrope example I have here. If you're the person on the tightrope, you can walk forward, you can walk backward, you have one dimension in which to move. But if you're that little ant right there, you can walk forward, you can walk backward, but you can also walk around the tightrope, which is just like string objects moving around an extra dimension. And uh, so here's t-duality, and uh, those extra dimensions I talked about could be both quote-unquote big or small. And so t-duality in general is the idea that a large dimension should behave the same as a small dimension. So the physics of a dimension with a radius of r, which I've represented with this large circle here, should be equal to the physics of a dimension with radius 1 over r, which I've represented with a little circle there. Um, and this t-duality is very important in that it sort of allows for the creation of these bridges. You can think of them kind of like a bridging the different string theory objects to make them t-dual to each other. So here are two objects that are t-dual to each other, the ones that I've been working primarily with, and that is the NS5 brain and the blues klein monopole here. So um, as I've stated here, objects related by t-duality must have the same physics. That's what makes them t-dual to each other. And uh, as you can see by the arrows here, the monopole can move up and down, and so can the NS5 brain, and that's just moving that's just moving up and down in our normal three dimensions we would think of. They can also move in any of the other normal X, Y, Z sort of directions that we can move in. Um, but as you can see, the NS5 brain there can also move around the extra dimension, just like that ant could. Whereas if you move the monopole around, 
it's not really going to do anything because it'll still be in the same position because it, it extends all the way around the extra dimension. So rotating it isn't going to do much. So here are the background matrices that sort of describe these. And um, I've included the metrics for both of them, which remember is just what the shape of space is. And they look a bit more frightening because it's describing now a curved space as opposed to flat space. But um, Anyway, as you can see, this, this column here and this row here are both in the k position, which just denotes that extra dimension I was talking about. Um, but also, as you'll see at the bottom here, I've included this b. And what that is is just a b field, which is sort of akin to you could think of it as an electrical field. Um, that just descri It describes something similar to an electrical field that shows up in these string objects. So, some of you may have noticed that there are some similarities between the matrices for the NS5 frame and the Kuzakline monopole. Um, oh, and also, I should make a note that I've included a smear here. Um, that's going to be important. I'll explain it at the end of the talk in more detail. But it's just important to note that this is a smeared NS5 frame solution. Um, and I'll have a picture of that later. But that's just an NS5 frame that's sort of been averaged around the extra dimension. But anyway, so like I said, there may, you may notice some uh, similarities here. And there they are. Um, so as you can see, the arrows on here sort of indicate what terms are switched between the two. Um, and as you can see, they all come from that extra dimension. Uh, but yeah, so you can see that down here, we have the 1 half, 1 minus cos theta. Which is, kind of, which is somewhat similar to the term up here in the monopole. And over here in the NS5 frame, we're switching these zeros down here with this B field. So they have these, this nice correspondence, and that's what makes them T-dual. And you can transform between the two of them using the Boucher transformation rules. Um, those are just a set of rules that <coughs> lay out exactly how, given a metric and a B field for one object, you can switch between so here's where I actually start doing some of my own work. These are met this next section is mathematical functions that I myself made just to implement these Boucher rules. And there they are. The first one, the one that I've labeled dual G, um, and I, I'm going to say right now, I don't expect anyone to read through that and understand all the lines of code in it. It took me a little while to get it. But um, these are just here for your reference. Um, but this first one just applies those Boucher rules to any to a given object to produce the t-dual metric of it. And then the bottom one does exactly the same thing, but it produces the t-dual B field for any object. Um, and then these aren't Boucher rules in any way, but they're extra functions that I found helpful to make. This first one that I've called lambda just gives a coordinate transformation matrix. Um, and that's just a matrix that allows you to switch between two different coordinate systems, such as from, from the Cartesian that we had before to spherical. Um, and then down there, the one that I've labeled B with the mu and the nu after it, just generates a B field matrix from a gauge parameter vector, which I will explain uh, later on as well. Um, but basically, you put it in there. It's usually labeled C, so that's why I've got it C there. Um, and that just gives you sort of a generalized B field. All right, so what I ended up doing with these function was, functions was analyzing another specific string theory object called the Clues Klein Dyna. And there it is. So as you can see, it looks fairly similar to the monopole, but there's also these arrows here. And those are meant to indicate an additional degree of freedom that this dion has. Um, and that sort of extra freedom comes from this, this thing that shows up in the B field called beta. Um, but beta is basically the, controlling the angle of these blue arrows here, which is we can think of kind of like a direction around a circle. And lo and behold, the NS5 frame moves around a circle. And that's where we lost our deg extra degree of freedom before. So. Um, as I stated before, t dual objects must have the same physics, and missing the degree of freedom from the monopole is clearly a problem. So this provides one way we might be able to fix that. All right, so my next step, <coughs> once I did that, was to say, OK, so I have this Kluzekline dion, and now I want to take it and make it into an NS5 frame, and figure out what the t dual NS5 frame is. So 
first I needed to have the metric and the B field for it, and the metric is exactly the same as the monopoles metric was, all the terms are in the same place and everything. And But the B field it contains these interesting non-zero terms sort of off the diagonal, whereas with the monopole they were all just zero. Okay. So, um, the first thing I did was apply the Boucher rules, because they're what you use to find t-dual objects. So I applied dual G and dual B, and I got a new metric for the NS5 frame and a new B field for it, which you can see here. And as you can see, there's obviously there's some similarities between between the these and what the original were, but uh, there's also some additional components. So my next question was, well, is there any way I can manipulate these new matrices without changing the fundamental physics behind them? And indeed, there is. I can do a coordinate transformation. Um, so a coordinate the coordinate change I sort of determined from the metric here. I I took a look at it. And I said, okay, well, the interesting thing in the metric happens here and here. And since this is symmetrical, I can just choose one of these to focus on. So I'll focus on that one in the top there. So it's in the K row. So something's happening to the K coordinate. And it's also here in this R row. So I integrated that with respect to R. And got out that K prime is equal to the original coordinate K plus this factor right here. Um, I then put that into my lambda coordinate transformation matrix and came out with this coordinate transformation matrix um, that should, hopefully, once I did all the math, allow me to switch from the uh, new metric back to the original nice looking metric. And it turns out it does. You go through the matrix multiplication and you get out the original NS5 frame metric. Now, obviously, since I've switched the metric into a new coordinate system, I have to switch the B field into the same coordinate system. So I did the same sort of multiplication, and I got what I've labeled the not quite original NS5 frame B field. Um, it's got those nice, the, these terms right here, which is exactly what we want, but this stuff up here is sort of added on and extra things. So uh, looking at that, my next goal was determine if there are any additional transformations I can do to, once again, not changing the physics, to sort of make that B field look like the original B field. And once again, there's a gauge transformation. So gauge transformations are just transformations that can relate physically equivalent fields, like the B field. Um, they don't change any of the physics behind it or anything, so they're perfect to use. And uh, so what I did was, once again, I said, hmm, OK, well, the interesting bits are here, where there's a phi. And I can pick any one of those two. So looking looking at the row, because this is, this is anti-symmetric, so What's here is actually mirrored negatively down here. So once again, I had my pick of where I wanted to look at things. But I, I took one of those terms, and I was able to calculate the gauge parameter vector C, like I mentioned before, that has zeros everywhere except right in the phi where it's changing. And then I put that into my B mu nu function, and I got out this matrix down here, which, as you can see, these terms and these terms match up very nicely with these terms and these terms, which means if you apply that gauge transformation, you get the original NS5 frame B field, which is exactly what we wanted. So, all right, now it's time for conclusions, so everyone can say yay. Um, all right, so my conclusions on here is basically that the Kluze-Klein dion is indeed t-dual to the NS5 frame and simply rotated around that extra dimension by some sort of beta angle, um, which is just that extra parameter I talked about before. And I tried to illustrate that for you down here by saying, when if you look at this when in the limit when r goes to 0, it will simplify down to just the original k plus that beta, which tells us you know, that it's just switching it by the angle beta. Um, and then my other conclusion is that through gauge, I found through gauge and coordinate transformations, I can produce the original smeared, remember I called it smeared before, NS5 frame. And this time I actually have a picture of it for you. Um, and what the smeared means, as you can see, is that it took that one single point that was the NS5 frame and averaged all of its positions around that extra dimension. So it's good that I was able to return to it because it means everything's consistent. However, because we're returning to a smeared averaged result, um, rotating a smeared thing around the, the circle by some angle beta is going to do the same thing it did with the 
monopole, which means it's not going to really change its position at all. So it's clear that the dion is providing only part of the picture. And in order to fully understand it, we would need a more sort of localized Luzekline monopole solution, which is what Dr. Denson is currently pursuing work on. And uh, that's it. So, any questions? <laughs> Yes? So, for someone that's more or less ignorant in physics, yes. like, why, why did you do this? Why, like, what changed in the world now that people know that? That can be done. And, like, you're I mean, asking completely out of No, 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 no. It's a perfectly good question and one that should probably be expected when doing this type of highly theoretical work. Um, well, in all honesty, I'll, I'll explain it to the best of my ability because like I said, it's highly theoretical, and I don't even understand all the nuances of the theory and everything. But uh, we don't know for sure whether this is even right yet. So it's all internally consistent as far as we can tell, and everything is looking like uh, it's working out so far. But we don't have any sort of concrete evidence that I can show you and say, yes, this is how the world works. We can definitely describe it in this way, and it will make everything much clearer. But we're hoping that we can, because it so it basically makes physics smoother. It, it, it fixes the disagreement between quantum mechanics and general relativity. So, so it's sort of like politics. Then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's politics makes the disagreement between. Uh, any other questions? <coughs> now, when you say monopole, what, what oh. immediately comes to my mind is. A charged thing. <laughs> yes. Right. Um, so what I was looking for there in, in some of those equations, I guess, was called a charge is going to be irrelevant unless it's surrounded by other charges. Mm. You want interactions? That's kind of what I. Why, why do you care about a monopole unless you're bringing in other? Charges or fields or something. I maybe I just missed this. This probably sounds like something that I should handle. Um, uh, sort of. I mean, <laughs> I can, okay, I can point out that the uh, B field for the monopole was all zeros, so it wasn't really doing much interesting with its sort of electrical field, whereas the dion clearly was. But uh, I wouldn't really know how to go into it more than that. So, so well, what I'd say in, in answering that. Um, and as Alex points out, the B field, which acts like one type of generalized electric field thing, is zero for the monopole. Uh, there are, that's one source in string theory of things that act like charged stuff. There's also, in the, the metric matrices, the G matrix that he showed us in a number of places, the final column and the final row of that matrix also describe an electric type field. And so anything that wasn't zero there showed that there w corresponds in our world, in our familiar you know, physics, to ordinary electric or magnetic types of fields. So um, the thing to say in terms of inter interactions and things is that um, the, the nice thing about talking about, say, electrons, when we do that in physics, is that we get to sweep under the rug all the details of the mathematics behind electrons. It turns out that people, even in classical physics, don't know what an electron really is or how it works. There's this horrible problem, if you've ever done, uh, if you've ever taken a class that talks about electric fields, that the electric field of an electron is proportional to one over the distance squared from the electron. And you may notice that the distance goes to zero, that electric field goes to infinity, which is bad because electric fields are supposed to carry energy, and so it, had, it would have infinite energy associated with a single electron. So people in ordinary physics haven't understood even what a charge was. They are able to say, OK, we can talk about interactions between charges. And we could, if we really wanted to, talk about that too. The hope in string theory is that if we really understand this type of monopole, which is a magnetic monopole of this sort of generalized electric field, if we really understand this, this type of object, hopefully in string theory, we won't have that infinity problem that has plagued understanding of electric charges in classical physics. String theory can get around those things. So we can do the interaction stuff if you really want to. And you can figure out the probability that two charged things will scatter off of this monopole or something. Uh, you, can, you can do those calculations. The, what we're trying to understand 
is the fundamental mathematics that describe the object itself. Something that wasn't available to be understood in classical physics, but that string theory may have something to say about if, as Alex said, it turns out to have any relevance to the physical world at all. So what's, I'm going to mispronounce it, what's a Dion? I mean, to me, a, a Dion. I mean, D, Dion is a musician. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you said Dion? Yeah. Uh, so what, what's that? What's a the brain? definition of that is kind of related <laughs> to the manifold. It's um, as opposed to having one sort of, is it a magnetic type of pole? Yeah, so you're, you're on the right track, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, as opposed to having one sort of magnetic pole, the dion has two, which is why it can create those extra, um, you know, like to go back to the picture. That's me. Um, those blue arrows there were supposed to kind of indicate it, it has these two poles, which is why it can create actually something in the speed field that, that we try to represent with these sort of blue arrows and the orange arrows indicating their direction. So the dion, it's basically just, um, it, has, it has two magnetic poles on it as opposed to one, and that creates a field. The, the dion term is specifically referring to any type of object that is charged in more than one way at once. So the Kaluza-Klein monopole itself, as you, as you had said earlier, uh, it's, it has, as, as we had talked about earlier, the kluge klein monopole is a monopole under one of these generalized electric field type things, uh, under the one that comes from the G matrix, the metric. When you go to the dion, it also had contributions in the B matrix, the B field. And so it's charged both under the electric field that comes from G and the electric field that comes from B, hence the di two, the, 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 the two charges. It's charged under both, whereas the monopole is only charged under one of them. Technically speaking, the kluge klein monopole is magnetically charged under the G1, and the dion has an electric charge under the B1, but that's not really important here. All right, if there are no further questions, let's...